Okay, the recording is on. Welcome to BC213, our course on the end times. Um, we didn't have class last week, uh, but I think we are in good shape to cover what we need to cover. Um, let's take a moment to pray and we'll get started for today. Could um, somebody please pray with us and we'll start. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. God, we thank you that you are a God who wants to reveal the mysteries to us, Jesus. You always want to tell us what you are about to do, what you did, because you are a God who seeks a relationship with us, Lord. We thank you for this love. We thank you for this amazing grace. God, I pray that uh, we will be filled with your revelation today as we go through the classes. I pray that you will help us to open our mind and heart and listen to the deep truths in the Bible so that we can shine much more brighter for you, so that we can be a blessing to others. I bless Pastor Ashes and all my classmates over here and who are about to come. God, I pray for good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. Be with us and guide us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good morning once again. So we are still in... Uh, our lesson number four, which is we are creating or we are trying to understand a timeline of the sequence of events. I just want to um, quickly recap a few things and then can pick up from where we paused last week. So in, in our lesson, chapter four, we are trying to get an overview overview of the events so we started from here church age we, we talked about the rapture of the church how christ returns uh, we looked at first thessalonians 4 first corinthians 15 then we talked about what's going to be happening in heaven heaven during the seven years uh what will be uh, what what we can expect there and then we said Okay, to understand what's going to go on here on earth, we're going to go to the book of Revelation just to give us an overview of what's happening here on earth during this, from this point on. So this is where we turned to the book of Revelation and we said, okay, let's see what's going to happen. In Revelation chapter 1, John has a vision of the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus says, record that, record what you have seen. Then, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the Lord Jesus said, record things that are. That means chapters 2 and 3 had to do with things that were going on at that time, which is around AD 90, when John was having the revelation. So chapters 2 and 3 deal, uh, deal with the seven churches that existed at that time. From chapter 4 onwards is into the future. The Lord Jesus told him, told John, Revelation 4.1, record these things that are going to come. So chapter 4 verse 1 onwards is out in the future, which means it's in here in our timeline. And then what we said is um, chapters 4 and 5, Revelation 4 and 5, are giving us a little insight in what's happening in heaven. There's worship going on, uh, and the elders are seated around the throne. They are worshiping the Lord. And it's at that time that um, the Lamb of God, that is the Lord Jesus himself, he comes and takes the scroll, and he opens the scroll. So basically signifying the beginning of the fulfillment of prophecy. The scroll. Uh, in, in Bible, imagery is often ref used to talk about prophetic matter, prophetic information, prophecy. And so the scrolls open, uh, the prophetic things are beginning to unfold. That's uh, from, starting from, that's Revelation chapter 4 and 5. From chapter 6, Revelation 6, is where we, the first of the seven seals are opened. So that's the beginning here of the tribulation. So we see the seals, the seven seals being opened one after the other. 
each uh, representing something that's happening on earth, a judgment of God. Revelation chapter 7, we saw that during this time, there are 144,000 Jewish people whom God marks to be servants of God during this time. Second part of Revelation 7, we see so many people who are martyred or killed during the tribulation. They're up in heaven. They're worshiping God. Revelation 8, we begin to see the seven trumpets. So there are seven seals of judgment. Then there are seven trumpets. So the seven trumpets, uh, judgments are starting to be poured out. Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 9. While, while this is happening, uh, the trumpets are continuing. We are seeing some more uh, judgments uh, in Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 10 is what we refer to as a, as a parenthetical chapter. That means it's part of John's experience. It's not part of what is actually happening here on earth uh, during the tribulation. But John's experience, the, an angel comes and says, you know, I want you to eat this book. Uh, again, signifying that there's more you have to prophesy about, you have to talk about. So John eats the book. That's chapter 10. Chapter 11, 12, and 13. Chapter 11, 12, and 13 clearly indicate that we are at the middle of the tribulation. So chapter 11 is somewhere here, in the middle of the tribulation. And... Uh, it talks about the two witnesses. It talks about Jerusalem being trampled, the two witnesses and the ministry for the second part, from the middle of the tribulation till the end of the tribulation. Chapter 12 then talks about how uh, Satan is going to go after the people of Israel for the last, for the next three and a half years. He knows his time is short. And so for that three and a half year period, he's going to really attack uh, the Jewish people and those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then chapter 13 is talking about the beast, meaning the Antichrist and the false prophet and what they will do. So chapter 13 talks about how the, uh, the Antichrist is going to set himself up to be worshipped. He is seeking to be worshipped. And of course, backing the Antichrist and the false prophet is the dragon, which is the devil himself. So the Antichrist is seeking to be worshipped. And uh, he also sets in place what we, we are referring to as a global financial system. People cannot buy and sell unless they have the mark of the beast. And the Antichrist, the beast, is supported by the false prophet. The false prophet is doing signs, wonders, and miracles. And he's getting people to worship the image of the beast. So he's, he's really supporting, but he's doing it through religion. So we refer to the work of this man, uh, the second one, the false prophet as a religious leader, setting up a world global religious system. What form that will be, we don't know. Uh, uh, you know, we can we can imagine or we can speculate a lot of things. Uh, you know, because Revelation thirteen says uh, he he gives people an image of the beast, and that they have to worship that image, and that image is able to kill the people. You know, so uh, I mean, this is just of interest that when you look at the news, when you read some some things that happen in the news. You know, people today are creating robots that can speak and they can do things. And strangely enough, they have created images of saints to be worshipped. So in some places, and I, I was reading this, I think an article on BBC or somewhere I've seen, they have, uh, you know, the image of the saint, whatever saint, and it will speak. Because it's a robot, you know, it's trained to speak and trained to, you know, make some gestures. And the people are coming to worship, you know, like how previously they used to worship an idol. Now, instead of an idol, there's a robot that 
you know, so it kind of gives it a lifelike feeling. But that's happening these days. It's it's a little funny, uh, you know. So you, you can imagine uh, if the false prophet wanted to use something like that, create an image of the beast that is, you know, like a robot and has given power to even kill people. That's that's very doable today with the technology we have. Anyway, so that's Revelation 13. Revelation 14, where we stopped last week, uh, last two weeks back, we said is a chapter of announcements. Uh, so we're still here uh, in, the, in the middle of the tribulation going forward. And we see in Revelation, I'll stop sharing this picture. Uh, we see in Revelation 14, uh, angelic announcements. And there are five angels announcing to the peoples of the world different things. So there's one angel uh, that's announcing the or proclaiming the everlasting gospel, Revelation 14, 6. Revelation 14, 8, there's another, another angel announcing that Babylon is fallen. It's meaning it's going to fall, telling the people Babylon is fallen, warning the people. And we will see that happening in chapter 17 and 18, the fall of Babylon. We'll explain what it means. Then there's a third angel, Revelation 14, 9, is warning the people, don't worship the mark of the beast. Then there's a, a fourth angel announcing that there's going to be a great harvest of souls. And there's a fifth angel, Revelation 14, 17, announcing that the judgment of the Lord is about to come. And this angel also describes how serious this judgment is going to be. Uh, uh, Revelation 14, 19, it says, uh, 19 and 20, Revelation 14, 19 and 20, it says that uh, blood will flow outside the city of Jerusalem as high as a horse's bridle that is about uh, uh, five, six inches high uh, and 1,600 furlongs, that's about 184 miles, uh, blood is going to flow, Revelation 14, 20. So that means he's announcing judgment is coming and this is what the judgment of God will cause to happen, uh, such destruction. and. This is what will happen at the Battle of Armageddon. So the angel is announcing this is going to come and the Battle of Armageddon will, will, will result in this kind of devastation, right? So we are here now at the end of Revelation 14. We're just following the sequence of events in the book of Revelation. Any questions so far? Everyone has been following along? I think okay. Yes, that's good. Okay. Yes, All right. So let's pick up now in Revelation chapter 15. So we now come to the, the last set of seven judgments, which are the seven bowls. Right? So we're just giving an overview of Revela the book of Revelation. We will go into the details, like I was saying. Uh, in in the third third year, we'll read everything. So, in chapter fifteen, it's just uh, it is a preparation, getting ready for the seven bowl judgments. Okay, that means this is the final set, and there is a picture of uh, 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 Revelation fifteen. There are people who are worshiping the Lord in heaven, and they're singing the psalms uh, of. Uh, of uh, Moses, and then the angels are getting ready to pour out the seven bowls. So they'll be getting ready for the final, you could say, uh, the final lap. This is the end. Revelation chapter 16, as these bowls of judge. So this Revelation 16 is describing one after the other, the bowl, seven bowls of judgment being poured out. And 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 each of these things, you know, we'll just quickly mention what these are. Revelation 16, 2, uh, it's a foul and loathsome source on the people. Revelation 16, 3 is the second bowl judgment. 
blood uh, is poured on the sea and blood as of dead men filling the sea uh, verse 4 revelation 16 for the third bowl of judgment that is destroying the waters becoming blood revelation 16 8 the sun uh, is, is is so strong it becomes so strong it's like burning heat scorching men with fire and notice the reaction of people at that time they're just blaspheming the name of god they're getting angry with god revelation 16 10 people there's a fifth bowl and um, there is uh darkness and uh, uh people are uh, in pain and they are and again once again they're having the sores and all of that and they are blaspheming the name of god uh, on the earth Revelation 16 12 is the sixth angel, and the great river Euphrates dries up so that kings from the east might be prepared. So, this is something to th think about. Now, what is happening is today in this world currently, uh, and again, these are news reports, is that the river Euphrates is beginning to. It's not, it's not dried up yet, but it's getting there. It's beginning to dry up, the river Euphrates. Now, uh, meaning the water levels are going down and so on. So, some people, I mean, of course, for us, it's you know, when we read it, it's of interest to us because here in Revelation 16 and verse 12, it says the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up. So it's of interest to us that the water levels in that river are going down and the river is getting close to, I mean, it hasn't dried up, but getting, getting close. Now, some people try to, you know, when you read these articles, um, some people try to deflect any connection with the Bible saying, no, 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 this is just the result of man not taking care of the environment and, uh, you know, climate change and uh, extreme weather conditions, etc., etc. So that's why this is happening, which may be true in the sense of, yeah, you know, there, there are changes in the environment and all of that. But for us, it is interesting that 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, when there would have been no sign of this great river ever drying up, John wrote that the river, great river Euphrates dried up. Now, for somebody to write that 2,000 years ago, when there was no concept of climate change, man not taking care of the environment, none of those things, those ideas were not there. And for him to write, the great river Euphrates dried up so that the kings from the east can move in was something amazing. It had to be uh, a prophetic word from God. Today we are seeing it's getting it's getting there. It hasn't happened yet, but it's getting there. The river Euphrates is, you know, drying up slowly. So it, that's very interesting. Okay, uh, even though the scientific community will have other reasons, I mean, other explanations. They say, "Oh no, no, this can this is this is a natural thing happening." Fine. But to think that somebody wrote about it 2,000 years ago, and here we are in our day, close to seeing it happen, is very significant. So John writes in Revelation 16, verse 12, that this great river Euphrates dried up, and kings from the east be, were getting ready to move in. So there's a, there's a big question, who are the kings from the east? It doesn't tell us here, right? 
but we can only you know we could only uh, what to say uh, think logically so east of israel or east of that region and remember he had mentioned uh, earlier 200 million uh, this is in uh, oh, what is this um in uh, chapter 9 and verse 13 he mentioned about an army of 200 million people who at that time this is revelation 9 15 uh, who were attacking people 200 million so and even that army came across the river Euphrates that was Revelation 930 so we're just putting this two piece of information together that I that that time he mentioned an army of 200 million people who were doing destruction or causing destruction at that time that is in Revelation 9 and here we're talking about Revelation 16 we're talking about kings meaning more than one king, multiple leaders moving their armies from the east. We could think about big countries like China, Russia, large countries moving in from the east. Whether a country like India would join them or not, I don't know. It all depends on the political dynamic. Uh, at that at that time, uh, I, I, India has relations with Russia. India has relations with Israel. So I don't know at that time what kind of a position a nation like India would take. But we can definitely see China and Russia being aligned to each other, moving in from the east. Right. The reason we are saying we are mentioning Russia and China is because of their size because Russia is also mentioned elsewhere in scripture refer or reference to elsewhere in scripture and because of their position east of the middle uh, the, 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 this area that we're talking about so and what is what is interesting verse 13 is that their demonic powers are being released he's saying frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet so unclean spirits like frogs okay a side note a side note and this is not uh, yeah, you know the main thing but side note is you see how evil spirits or or these animals like frogs or, or creatures like frogs are used to resemble evil spirits right so that's just a side note. Prophetic imagery. What do frogs represent? Unclean spirits. Revelation 16, 13. So unclean spirits are being are coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, meaning these people are speaking such things. It's actually demonic powers that are going and mobilizing the kings of the earth to come into battle. And this is actually a mobilization for the battle of Armageddon. So, Revelation 16, starting with the sixth angel, Revelation 16, verse 12, starting with the sixth bowl judgment, there is the mobilization of the battle of Armageddon. That means we are like coming close to the end. Sixth bowl, just two more left. Sixth bowl judgment, preparation for the battle of Armageddon. River Euphrates is drying up. Nations and armies from the east getting ready to go. The beast and the false prophet are speaking in such a way that it's like demons are coming out of their mouth, literally stirring up the nations to come against Israel. I'm spending a little bit of time on this because this is a very significant event, build up to a very significant event, the Battle of Armageddon. 
And it starts right there. Revelation 16, 12, with a sixth bowl judgment. And so the armies of the world are getting ready. They say, okay, we are going to go to fight against Israel. And so he says here in verse 16, you know, uh, verse 14, the battle of that great day of God Almighty, and God himself is also stirring up. The Lord Jesus saying, behold, I'm coming. So on the earth, armies are getting ready to move against Israel. Up in heaven, Jesus saying, I'm coming. You can imagine how everything is coming to this climax, this great climax of the Battle of Armageddon. So verse 16 says, and they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew, place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And so if it, if it's the valley of Megiddo, the northern part of Israel, they're beginning to come there, like a battleground. I mean, they're going to fight. Destruction is going to take place. So the seventh angel uh, pours, uh, pours out his judgment. Uh, there are, you know, catastrophic things happening in on the earth that's great earthquake like never experienced before the great city is divided nations are shaken uh, there are great hail or even you know things falling from the sky from the heaven uh, affecting the earth and men are blaspheming god at this time as nations are getting ready to go to war, two major things happen. That is chapter 17 and 18. I'll summarize it. In chapter 17, we read about Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon basically represents this world religious system that was set up by the false prophet. He said, why do, you, why do we say that? Uh, you know, when we read Revelation 17, uh, we see that uh, this mystery Babylon is referred to as a great harlot or a great prostitute. Now, in biblical language, harlotry is often used as a symbolic picture of people departing from the true and living God. To worship other gods, harlot, harlotry. It's like spiritual prostitution, they're going away. So that picture of a harlot is used. Secondly, mystery for mystery Babylon. Secondly, mystery Babylon also goes after killing the saints or yeah, persecuting and killing the saints, people who worship Jesus Christ. So the whole purpose of this mystery Babylon is to destroy those who worship the true and living God. So, and, and the very name, mystery Babylon, the, the use of the word mystery represents spiritual revelation, right? but the wrong kind, the wrong kind. So that's why, you know, based on these three things, we say that the mystery Babylon spoken of in Revelation 17 is pointing to this world religious system that was set up by the false prophet. And when you read Revelation 17, it kind of tells us the sequence of events that lead to the collapse of this world religious system. Basically, the Antichrist has been support and the false prophet, prophet are working together. But the Antichrist has was supported by these 10 world leaders represented by the 10 toes of Daniel, the 10 horns of Daniel. But it happens at this time in Revelation 17 that these 10 leaders, they reject the false prophet. It's like they turn, this, we don't want the false prophet. They reject him, the religious leader. And so with that, that whole thing collapses. So remember in, in, the, in Revelation 14, one of the angels, the second angel, was announcing, Babylon has fallen, Babylon has fallen. Well, one part of Babylon is this. The world religious system collapses. 
That's Revelation 17. Revelation 18, the next thing that happens is Babylon, the great city. So both Revelation 17 and Revelation 18 are talking about Babylon. But Revelation 17 is mystery Babylon, the great harlot. Revelation 18 is the great city Babylon, two different things. Both are representing a departure away from God, going away from God. But in Revelation 18, it's the great city Babylon, which represents the world economic system that was set up by the beast, the Antichrist. So if you read Revelation 18, suddenly, suddenly, it says, it happened so suddenly within one hour, the wealth of the nation's people just disappears just disappears the wealth of the people just becomes vapor so it talks about the merchants the people who would trade and sell it says all of their wealth just disappears within one hour so we have come to the very end of the seven year tribulation period it is the sixth sixth and the seventh bowl judgments happening nations are getting ready to go to war the battle of armageddon and at that time the world religious system and the world economic system collapses that is 17 and 18 chapter 17 18 and this is very you know very recognizable because today uh, and I'm just using this as an example. Today, you know, when we have Russia attacking Ukraine and doing all of that, we can see its impact on the global economic system. You know, uh, oil prices going up and uh, food and grain shortage, things like that. And this is one part, one nation against a smaller nation. But imagine the impact when many nations are gathering together for battle against Israel. Many nations are gathering. That means like the whole world is being stirred. And obviously, things are going to fall. And so, Revelation chapter 17 and 18 are uh, declaring the collapse of the world religious system and the world economic system, fall of Babylon. That brings us to the last uh, Revelation 19, which is the very end of uh, the, uh, 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 the, the, the build-up of events. Revelation 19, what do we see in heaven? That is the marriage supper of the lamp. So it's like a, a big uh, feast set up, a big table, and um, the Lord Jesus and, and 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 his church, the people, the marriage supper of the lamp takes place. And right after that, we see the Lord Jesus coming. Revelation 19. He comes to rule the nations with a rod of iron. He comes with power and authority and glory. And the armies of heaven, that is the saints of God and all the angelic hosts are coming. And uh, they're coming out of heaven, Revelation 19. And so while the nations have all gathered together against Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus comes from heaven, Revelation 19. And then it just says, He strikes them with the mouth of his word, with the word of his with the word of his mouth. He strikes them with the word of his mouth. And um, uh, Revelation 19 and verse 20. Uh, the beast and the false prophet are captured and they are cast into the lake of fire, taken out of the way. 
done. Beast and false prophet put in the lake of fire. And verse 21 says, the rest of the killed with a sword that proceeded from his mouth. And there was so much, uh, so many uh, people killed. It says the birds, the birds of the air, the birds were filled with their flesh, meaning so many lives destroyed, just with the word of his mouth. And the Lord comes. Now, in... Uh, Zechariah, that fourteenth chapter, Zechariah describes this in detail. He talks about the Lord descending on the Mount of Olives. Remember, when after his resurrection, when Jesus ascended, he ascended from the Mount of Olives, and the angel said, "The same Jesus will come in the way you've seen him go." So he ascended from the Mount of Olives. Zechariah chapter 14, the prophet Zechariah says, the Lord himself will descend on the Mount of Olives and the Mount will be split into two. So it's talking about his powerful return to the earth. And then Revelation 20, what happens? The Lord comes to set up his kingdom on the earth and rule out of Jerusalem for 1,000 years. That's the millennium. At this time, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 and 2, Satan is bound for a thousand years and he's put into the bottomless pit, meaning taken out of the way. Satan and all the demons, they're all taken out of the way. They're put in the bottomless pit. So at this time, when at the beginning of the millennium, when Christ comes, we can, you know, when we put all the pieces together, what happens? There is a cleansing, there's a cleaning up of the millennial temple. There's also the resurrection of all the people, the saints who died during the millennium, who were killed, so they received their resurrected bodies. The saints who have come with the Lord are with him. Uh, this is a fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7, where the kingdom is given to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his saints to administer. Paul the Apostle said that we will reign with Jesus, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So that's this, this is that period, the millennium, 1,000 years. So on the earth, we have people with glorified bodies because those, the saints have been resurrected. And also at this time, we have people who have come through the, the natural people, who have come through the tribulation, and they enter into the millennium. And the Lord Jesus has set up his throne in Jerusalem at this time. Isaiah describes this, Isaiah chapter 65, Isaiah describes this, uh, uh, the, 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 the change in the nature of things. He says, the lion will lie down with the lamb. A child will play at the house of the snake, meaning there's a change in the very nature of things during this time, life in the millennium. And life will go on. That is, natural people will be giving birth and people will be born during the millennium. Isaiah chapter 65 de describes this. People will die, the natural people. But those of us with glorified bodies, of course, with glorified bodies, we are like the angels of God. Our bodies are immortal. Our bodies do not die. We are here to extend the kingdom of Christ here on earth. And so we are seeing that happen during that 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. We don't have all details of what's going to happen during the 1,000 year reign other than what we have given to us in Isaiah 65. And we also understand from Luke 19, that's when Jesus says, you know, the reward for faithfulness in this life is he gives us authority over cities to govern those cities for in the name of the Lord and for the kingdom of God. During this time, part of our responsibility will be to teach the nations to worship the Lord. 
So um, uh, Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 11, uh, and Zechariah 14, they describe how uh, we will teach people, let us, let us go up to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem so that we can learn His ways. We can learn to worship God. And so part of our responsibility is to teach the nations how to worship the true and the living God. So this is this is some of the insight we have about the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, where the saints will administer the kingdom and uh, carry out uh, his government here on earth. And Isaiah describes you know, the government will be on his shoulder. Of the increase of his government and his kingdom, there will be no end. He's going to rule over the whole world. Over the whole world. Any, um, have you for all following me so far? Any questions? Okay. So, at the end of this 1,000 year period, Revelation chapter 20, uh, verse uh, 7 and 8, it says, Satan will be released from prison at the end of this 1,000 years. He'll be released from prison and he'll be given one last attempt. So he's going to go out and try and deceive the nations once again. And we don't know for how long he's going to be released. We don't know that, but he's going to be released and he's again going to engage the people. So it talks about the four corners of the earth. He talks about Gog and Magog. Uh, the tribes that were mentioned in uh, Ezekiel chapter chapters 38 and 39, uh, these Gog and Magog, and they will gather together to, uh, in battle um, against the city of Jerusalem. That is verse 9, Revelation 20 as, and verse 9. They're trying to come make a final attempt to attack the city of Jerusalem. And verse 9 says, Revelation 29, the fire of God came down from heaven and devoured them. So God himself intervenes and he defends his city and his people. And he, this is the end. Satan, Revelation 20 verse 10. He is going to be cast into the lake of fire forever. This is the end. So at the end of the thousand year period, after Satan is released briefly, the next thing is this, the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. The great white throne judgment. In this judgment, the Bible says, every person who ever lived, Every person. It says there in verse 12, Revelation 20, verse 12, 12 and 13, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 and 13, it says, every human being, wherever they died, whether they died in the sea, wherever, in the mountains, wherever, every human being is going to stand before the great white throne of God. Those who have gone to hell, it says that Revelation 20, 13, death and hell delivered up the dead. They're all going to come, stand before God. Now, we know that people have already been judged in the sense that those who are saved are saved. And those who have been sent to hell have been sent to hell. So. Why is there a need for this great white throne judgment? I can think of one reason. This is like the final accounting, final account, final, final act of God. God sits on this great white throne. 
on his left side are all the people who have rejected the Lord, who have rejected God. On his right side, so the goats, and then on the right are the sheep, those who have accepted him. The judgment is already there, but this is the final, you would say the final verdict being announced. Revelation 20 verse 15 says, Anyone whose name was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is it. Satan has been already sent to the lake of fire. Now, the goats, that means all whose names are not written in the book of life are, are sent away into the lake of fire. So this is a great white throne judgment. The next thing that happens after the Great White Throne Judgment is that there will be new heaven and new earth. That means, so when the Bible talks about heaven, so the word heaven is used in different ways. It's used, the word heaven is used to talk about the place where God dwells. The word heaven is also used to talk about the uh, universe, the place where all the stars and the planets are. And sometimes it's used in plural, heavens. right? And the, the word heaven is also used to talk about the atmospheric heaven, the thing that covers the earth, you know, as high as the heavens are above the earth, you know. Your faithfulness reaches up to the clouds. So it's talking about this heaven. So the word heaven in the Bible is used to talk about the atmospheric heaven. It's talking about it's used to talk about the um, the heavens that that we call as the universe. It's also used to talk about heaven as in the place where God dwells. So Revelation twenty and twenty one verse one. When it talks about new heaven, new earth, and the first heaven, the first earth passing away, it's not referring to God's dwelling place. That's eternal. But it's talking about the heavens, the universe as we know it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Revelation 21, verse 1. There's going to be new heaven and new earth, meaning that which he created in Genesis 1 1 is going to be completely renovated and fixed. It's going to full renovation. Second Peter chapter 3 describes this renovation. Peter writes, he says, the heavens will melt like being burned with fire. Now, it's hard for us to imagine in our minds this big, vast universe. You're talking about the universe because Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Revelation 21 1, the first heaven and the first earth, meaning everything God created, is going to be gone. So it's hard for us to imagine how this big universe is going to be renovated. But Revelation 21 and verse 1 says it's going to happen. Now, mathematically or in physics, it could be worked out, meaning there could be a collapse of this whole universe, just like being sucked in. You know, so somehow it's, it can happen. But it is going to happen. Revelation 21, verse 1. And 2 Peter 3, Peter says, Everything will melt with fire, gone, destroyed. And there will be new heavens and a new earth. 2 Peter, give you the exact verse. We'll look at all this de in detail next year. And now I'm just giving you an overview. Um, 2 Peter, chapter 3. Uh, you, know, you can read from verse 7 uh, to 8, 
uh, verse 4 to 8, he says, But the heavens and the earth, 2 Peter 3, 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of godly men. So he says they are reserved for fire. Right? And then he goes on to say, verse 12, Looking for looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the God of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. And verse thirteen, they are looking for new heavens and a new earth. Right. So, Second Peter chapter three: new heavens, new earth. Let's pause here. We'll take a break, come back, and uh, we'll continue this. And uh, if there are any questions, we'll take it up. Okay? See you in about 10 minutes. Thank you.